Hi, everyone. Welcome to Beacons of Balance. Here we are today on this beautiful day. And I'm here with Miss Linda and our guest speaker, Mr. Mel. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here. Thank you for tuning in and to either listening, watching, doing both. And Beacons of Balance is all about balance. And we're here to share little pearls with you to bring some cohesiveness into each of our lives. So Linda's going to introduce Mel to you. And Well, all you guys know, but Mel is my brother from another mother. <laughs> and I met Mel through a client of his who said, you've got to get together with this psychic in Chicago. And I, I looked at his webpage. He's been around. He's done television. He's done radio too, right? That's radio. Uh, he's helped find missing people. So I thought, well, let me check this guy out. So him and I got together and he came up just to check out my Sedona event. And he, he loved it. And we just started working together. We we're having a ball. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's and fun. we're also doing an event in September in Chicago, where he lives, September 20 what? Um, our... <laughs> 26, 27, 20, something like that. If you call his office, <laughs> you can get the info. But anyway, so he met Arlene in Catskills. He came to Catskills. Prior to that, though, I had did have a reading with Mel. Oh, oh that's, you did. That's, right. Yes, you did. I don't remember because you guys have so many people, but I did have a reading with you a while back. Oh, no, I remember the reading. I remember. Uh, it was a good thing. I don't mean it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> But I, so, so Mel, Mel, tell us about Mel. You know, I started doing my psychic readings when I was 18 and I'm 70. Okay. So do the math. That's a long time. I've been doing this longer than some people that have been, that they've been born, you know, but you know, my dad would have dreams that would come true. Uh, he was very uh, intuitive or psychic. I use it terms interchangeably. And his dad, my grandfather, who came from Germany on my dad's side, could find water with a stick. And I used to watch my dad and grandpa do it. It was kind of cool. Dowsing. I can, that's dowsing. I, this dowsing. No, I can, that's dowsing, yeah. Yeah, I can do it too, not as good as they could. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just something I could always do, which was just with me. And I thought everybody could do it. And one of the earliest memories I have, I think I was in first or second grade. And I just had a feeling that my grandfather, Dor, or in German is Dur, had had died. He'd been sick. When I came home, I looked at mom and I said, did grandpa die today? And she was crying. And she said, how did you know that? And I said, I just knew. You know, I just, it was clear cognizant. You don't know how you know, you just know. And then when I was, um, you know, when I was 12, um, my mother was a phenomenal cook and she was the cook. And, and in those days of bowling alleys had restaurants and she was the, the cook. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And um, she'd also wait the tables and then cooks food, go figure. <laughs> wow. But one of the ladies who worked there, I saw her doing my mom's cards. And I said, I want you to do mine. And she didn't tell me I was too young. And she pulled a card. She goes, you can do what I can do. You have the gift. And I was like, I think I was like 11 or 12. And she said, it's going to come to you. I think she said the number eight. You could be 18. It could be whatever. Well, that's all I had to hear. I got my first pack of gypsy witch cards and I learned how to read those. And so when I was 18, I started doing readings. But I went to college and I got my master's in psychology because I was interested in psychic stuff. And that didn't explain it. Um, my mother had a cousin who, a first cousin who lived in Chicago. And we were poor when we were kids, but every now and again, we, we'd make a trip here to Chicago. And I said, always said, that's where I'm going to live. So when I finished college, I moved here and I was a social worker for 10 years in geriatrics, but I did my psychic work at, at night and on the weekends. So after 10 years of that, I just said, I'm doing my psychic work full time and here I am. So that's wow. the, that's the long version let me that's, ask you something because you just hit on you said you were um you worked at uh, <clears throat> geriatrics with social work so i'm sure a lot of, of course that's elderly and maybe some people that were crossing over or anything like that did you get that information because you had the gift hits with them yes you went in and talk, yeah yeah Not at all. I, I, mean, I have but... um, a medical well, like linda well, i was an x-ray technician after i closed my angel shop and i got divorced whatever 
I went back to a former career and I was a mobile x-ray tech. So I used to go cover nursing homes and that wasn't my gig, but I would walk in and they're out of it. You know, they're drugged up a lot of them or so. Ever, and they would smile at me and they would be looking and I had to turn around and look, I'm looking and I was bringing, I know I was bringing the angels in with me. They saw them, you know, wow. and I would, talk, I would talk to them and a lot of them, you know, were out of it, but then they would get with it when I was there and they would tell me, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. And I said, well, you know, there's a cord, our silver cord to, and I said, you could cut that anytime you want to, honey. Well, a week after I had just started this job, the another tech, she used to pull the file. For, back then it was the hard copies, of the x-rays, not like it's going oh, yeah. to be. Oh, yeah. So she would clear out the rack every weekend when she would look at the obituaries, right? So she had a stack of them and I came in. I was new to the job. She goes, Arlene, I go, what? And she goes, look at this pile. She said, you were the last person to go into x-ray. These people, they died after you left. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. I go. I said, oh my God, I'm going to lose my job. They're going to think I'm Kevorkian. So I had I had to stop talking about it. I was just like, mm, forget it. But anyways, I was just curious about that, being that you were in that field, if you were also you know, tying that in with it. You know? I, I had a thing that um, if I knew somebody was dying and sometimes the families wouldn't come around for who knows what reason, but that I thought if that were me or a family member of mine laying there, what would I do? And I wouldn't want them to be alone. So there were times I would stay the night there or hold their hands until they died. But I would send them telepathic messages like it's okay to let go. It's okay to let go. It's okay to cross over and go to the light. And a lot of times, you know, if they were out of it, they would open their eyes and have a lucid moment and say, oh, so-and-so's here who was like an, an angel or a dead relative or something. Uh, and I saw that numerous times. And it was funny when they, and I was with a lot of patients when they did cross over and it's, it's funny, you know, you can almost feel their soul lifting uh, one to the other side. And I got cold chills. That happened numerous they, I volunteered at hospice. I was in the pastoral care department, okay? And as you know, you let them talk. You know, I had to zip this and let them express everything. Hard for me sometimes, but I listened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But after a while, they wanted to know about, you know, everything. But um, I say when that realm when they're ready to leave, including my own, I was with my own mother and that you could, like you said, it's palpable. You could feel it. You could feel, oh, it's so beautiful. People are afraid of it. You know, family members, they don't want it. Like you said, people don't show up because they, they're afraid of it. They don't want to acknowledge it. But what a gift. It, I, I felt so blessed to be there. And I remember walking into hospice if I had, because I would come from, you know, of course I had my, my business and everything. And I, I would have maybe a tough day, personal stuff going on. As soon as I opened up that door, it was like, whoosh, everything was gone. Everything was gone. I was just present there. And wow. this world would be different if people could volunteer in a hospice situation where people are crossing, a lot of people can't do it, or babies being born because the the realms are open on each side then. You know? puppies. <laughs> Puppy, well, anything, any anything it being born right or leaving either way either way because well, my little yorkie she was 19 and did not want to go now she did not want to go she was curled up like a little cat in a basket and i i had sage i smudged her i was playing music singing releasing <laughs> and she wanted to stay <laughs> well she's on the other side having a good time oh i know you know i know that i know um, that. you know it's so, funny a lot of times people would ask me What's it like when you are with somebody when they die? Or I say when they cross over, because I don't believe we die. And I would say, you know, there's that palatable, that that palpable feeling that you get that the soul has left. But I think people want to know is that there's this blare of trumpets and this big, you know, and it's not. It's just very peaceful when they take their last breath. And then you can feel like just this energy shift and you can feel that soul leaving but it's not like trumpets blaring or things like that it's just it's it's a it's a very subtle feeling but but yet you can feel it yeah definitely. yeah because like that woman said there's no such thing as death you're not the woman that was dead under the water for 30 minutes she said you're alive and then you're more alive you're conscious and then you're more conscious it's just an awakening right absolutely that's right, you know. Um, um, so, 
you know, after doing that for a while, I just wanted to do my psychic work. And I, you know, I, I stopped being a social worker and I started doing this. And um, there was a, a radio show here where I went on. This was many years ago. And a producer at one of the TV shows heard me and he asked me to come and do a television show, my first TV show. I watched the footage of it, you know, way back when I was like, <laughs> but they liked it. And it was, <laughs> and so it was a big show here in Chicago. And from there, I became a a, a regular on the show. It was called Lifestyle. And Pat Sheffer, who hosted the show, she won Women in Cable Award, all kinds of stuff. She just passed away recently. I just found out. Oh, wow. wow. But uh, she was really a pioneer. And, uh, you know, I've done national television and then radio and national radio and all kinds of stuff. And um, I started doing a lot of uh, forensics cases on missing people and murder cases. So I've done yeah, a lot that's of- that's interesting. Yep. So how <laughs> did you read? Did you read the case or did you just, did they, or are you also, um, and I don't know what the term is, when you hold an object, what's that called? I use psychometry. Psychometry. Yeah. Did you use that? You can. Um, I worked on a case, you know, I forgot how it came about actually it was a missing person. I said, they're still alive. They're in Florida, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then word got around. Now, if it was a murder case or a big profile case, I would never call the police department, offer information. And I get a lot of people from YouTube asking me, oh, I got a hit on a case. I'm going to, I'm going to call. And I say, don't because the police departments get inundated by calls from people saying they're psychic. And I've actually seen cases where people got in trouble because psychically they knew too much and that made them a suspect. So you oh, got to wow. be with it. There was a nurse on Unsolved Mysteries that got a hit on a nurse that was missing. And she just drove, got in her car and drove up to the hills. And then she saw those white shoes and found the body. She served jail time because they thought she had something to do with it. Right. I've seen that. In fact, there was oh, a wow. There was a very famous case here in Chicago called the Dewalaby case. And it was a little girl who went missing. And the police department came to the person I used to work with on criminal cases, Linda Patrine, another Linda. <laughs> Linda was excellent on, on, on missing persons. And um, Linda called me on the case, called me in on the case a little bit later. But Linda said, you know, unfortunately, she's deceased. She she uh, described where they would find the body, blah, blah, blah. And she told the family this. So when the FBI came to talk to the child's stepfather, he said, was the body in this position? Did you find it here? And what he had, he described is exactly what Linda had seen and what I had seen. So I told her, I said, Linda, you better be very careful because you're going to get called to court on this. And she said, you're crazy. Well, she was the first psychic in the state of Illinois to be called to court on a murder case for the defendant. Uh, and the stepfather was found guilty, but later his case was overturned because of some of the stuff we're talking about. It was a really famous case. There was a book written. Wow. By Rob so Pro he murdered this old girl. He didn't. They said he did, but he didn't. His What's, case. What do you think? Did he or didn't he? Um, Linda and I felt that he he wasn't the perpetrator. Um, we think the perpetrator was an uncle of the child. Did they ever find out? Did they ever solve it? Well, the problem was, well, there's a book written, uh, Gone, in, Gone in the Night by uh, Dave Protis and Rob Warren. And I remember Linda and I going down to NBC to talk to them about this case uh, after uh, uh -huh. there had been indicted. But he was he was later found not guilty. It was I mean, the case was overturned. The police department, though, always said he was guilty because they didn't want egg on their face. Other investigators investigated the uncle, who was a paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, but a lot of the evidence pointed to the uncle. And the case is still open, by the way. Wow. wow. How many years ago was that? Oh, goodness, 20 or 30 years ago. Wow. So if police department, if like a family member would come to me or Linda or both of us together, we would take a case on the following stipulations. One, there was no pay. We didn't want to get paid for it. Two, that we would not go to the press. 
And three, that if the police came to us, we would no longer have anything to do with the family members. And the reason for that is, is because a lot of times a family member is a prime suspect or a person of interest. And so, you yeah, know, the, it gets, it gets the, all entangled. Correct. And there was, yeah. and she was a forensic sketch artist and we'd work for like to try to find a perpetrator. If it was a murder case, we would describe what we thought the perpetrator would look like and she would draw it. And it was, it was really neat. So, um, Wow, that's fascinating. So how what so you did that and then did you just step away from it or they you know how well I did that and I did my readings. I charged for my readings, of course. But well, you know, the police work we did you, you know You just did it. Yes. Well, you, you yeah. have to pay it back and you have to pay it forward. Yeah, exactly. So we did it because we felt it was our way to give back. Yes. Well, and I have a blessing from the Pope. From my work with Miss, I Asia. saw that from what Pope Paul um, II, I, the, and he was sainted. How he, did you get that? <laughs> uh, a, Were you in Italy? Uh, yes, <laughs> a friend of mine, whose brother-in-law was the Archbishop of Naples. There was a case in Italy, and it was about um, something about a gun and and mafia uh, organized crime there, and um, the. Uh, they asked for my opinion. I gave it. Um, so I was working in another case at the time. And, um, you know, they, I guess, you know, they told the Pope about it and whatever. And he said, I'll give him my blessing. So I got the blessing. <laughs> that's what, wow. That's something. Uh, really something. Um, yeah. I've, that's why well, when you go out for tea or coffee or a drink with him, he can just, he's got so many stories. Well, he brings yeah. it around with him. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> well, you know, off the top of your head, I've worked on so many of them, it's hard to think. But when you start talking about it, they come back, you know, it's like, whoa. So I want to ask you something. This could go to you, Linda, also. Um, the difference between a medium and psychic, my understanding is psychic people, you know, I mean, we all have our intuition that, that they get their hits, they use, uh, you know, crystals, cards, whatever it could be, all right? And they're more about the um, past, present, future. And mediums are more connecting to the other side of the deceased loved ones. I know everybody throws labels out there. This is what I, you know. And a medium could be both, could be a medium and a psychic. Okay. But they say a psychic isn't a medium. I disagree with that. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, an, I want to clarity. That's all. I'm just for our audience sake. Too. I'm an old spiritualist from way back when. A lot of times people think mediumship is talking to the dearly departed. That's true. It is. But we look at all the clairs, you know, the clear cognizance, the clear sentience, the clear voyance, the clear gustance, the clear aroma, the clear audience. Gustance? Oh. I haven't, what is that? I haven't heard of that one. Teeth? <laughs> Claire Gustens, but I think it's you can. Did call you say it, teeth? No, Claire Gustens is taste. Oh, taste. <laughs> well, it goes to the teeth first, right? <laughs> I think. I think. I think it's Claire Ambience or Claire Aliens is another word for it. Oh, okay. But mm -hmm. all the Claires, we look at those as forms of mediumship. So when you do the psychic work, where does it come from? It comes from spirit. So what does a medium do? A medium. Hey, a medium takes what comes from spirit and passes it on. That's my definition. Now, if ever, so other people see it different ways, great. I don't have a problem with that. That's just how I look at it. So can I, just, I ask you, what is it called when you, like I had this woman I read yesterday, yeah. and she has a daughter that's very troubled, and I literally could almost step into the daughter's energy. That Ooh. wasn't a mediumship, but I can tell you, she lies she does this she i was just going off and the woman's going yeah yeah but it, i i would didn't become her but i could feel her energy so strong what is that well that's clear sentient that's clear feeling but it's also clear cognizance you know you don't know how you know or what you know you just know and going into their energy is also i think part of being an empath okay. and those are all gifts of spirit i think Okay. That Linda, Linda, you're just Whoopi Goldberg on Ghost. <laughs> and the church is going to go. 
Yeah. Well, and then now, your boy then your voice has to start changing. <laughs> Lyndon Grendel Bardon is one of the absolute best psychics I have ever worked with. She oh, has thank she, you, yeah, sweetie. She's phenomenal. Uh she's absolutely thank you. so it's yeah, it's true. So um yeah, so the different so you kind of answered uh, questions I was gonna ask you about all the different clairs, but you kind of covered that already. So that's why Yeah, I don't understand them. And um so well, how for, would you uh, go ahead. Go ahead. How would you um, bring to our audience with all of this to bring it into perspective of balancing it? Because I know from, you know, and I had my store and everything that a lot of people will come back and back and back. They don't know how to, you know, look inside themselves for answers and that, or they don't want to, they want, so it's kind of like the quick fix in USA, let's give a pill and let it be over with. So like they want that answer constantly and they, you know, and they want to, I mean, I know somebody that kept going to different, different readers, different psychics, different mediums until they heard what they wanted to hear. I call that psychic shopping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you give them the tools to find the, the consciousness within, but you can only, you can't save them. You can't do that. And I tell people straight out, Oh, look, honey, don't, you know, I had one woman that came to see me almost twice a week. She was leaving her husband and I said, you know, I, I really don't like you coming in like this because I can't, I can only, she said, listen, just to hear you talk is better than going to a psychologist. You just give me hope to move forward. And she used me until she was able to move forward. You yeah. know, when you're describing doesn't sound like psychic shopping. In other words, what Arlene was saying, I've had people that done this. <laughs> oh, I went to all these different people and I said, and they didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. And I tell them, if you're here for me to tell you what you want to hear, I'm the wrong person. I'm not. Yeah. Gonna... Whereas I think people going through crisis is different. You're not fostering a, a depend. They're not. I don't, you know. I call it psychic dependence. I don't want my clients to be dependent on me, but yet if it's helping them through a crisis, that's not them being dependent yeah. on us. That's us helping them through a crisis. There's a huge difference. Right. So with the the work that you do and everything, it's bringing to people, just bringing them comfort to balance them out. So they're not way off this way. It's, it's to let, to even them out. It's to let people know, in my opinion, in my, that, that, you know, and I get people going through some really hard times. I mean, some things you wouldn't even well, think of. And just to help them through it and to try to restore their faith in themselves and their faith that they can take their power back and they don't have to be a victim. And that's huge. That's, and that's the whole thing. And most of it, a lot of people here live in victimhood. And you don't have to. Oh, and when well, you live in victim, Margaret. I did for many years. Right, we all, I think. Have. I didn't think part of my life. Was, I did, but, the, but then when I when I reflected on it, I was still playing the victim card. Yeah, well, I can't, that's one thing, and I try to tolerate everybody, not have judgment. But when they're in victimhood, I get really like, oh, <laughs> it just drives me like, oh. That happened to me with somebody who made a choice, and it was like not a good choice, and then. You know, this person is playing the victim and the martyr. And, you know. What's the first name? Donald? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Donelda. <laughs> <laughs> so when they get into, into the matridom thing, I say, you know, do yourself a favor. Get off the cross. We need the wood for the barbecue. You know, I can get by with a lot of humor. <laughs> oh, God. And, and oh, Lord, I, we're going to have comments on that one now. <laughs> and then I can just blow on my desk. <laughs> That's my BS bell. <laughs> and, you know, I ring it lovingly and I ring it for myself a lot too. Uh, and people don't comment negatively about my get off the cross when need the wood for the barbecue. I think we all get into martyr mode and I am victim. Yeah. And I think we need to identify that in ourselves and step out of it. It's okay to feel it, but don't let it control you. Step out of it. I always talk, I talk about like it's playing a, a, a long playing record and you etch it in and you keep talking about it and talking about it. I bump into people from you know my store that I haven't seen for 20 years. And I used to facilitate a lot of groups, you know, healing groups and everything. And they're, I bump into them. They're still talking. And I'm like, oh, dear God. It's yeah. Still, and they still can't help about it. it. You can pray for them that they find a way out. But 
you can't help them. Okay. And they're trying to seek, they're trying, to, they're looking for it, but yet they're not hearing, they're not not feeling. Well, sometimes it. they hang on to it because that's the only thing they feel they have to hang on to. And it brings a lot of attention to them. And it's like, but wait a minute, you can let this go and, and figure out a, a lot more, more positive ways to move forward. Yeah. It's true. It's true. A lot to think about. Well, we're going to wrap up this part. And actually, we're going to continue on with Mel. Um, yeah, so much. Our next week, he's going to come back again for our next week episodes because these air every Wednesday. So, Mel, thank you for taking time to be with us. And um, this is oh, great. Thank you. We're, we'll continue on the topic and that. So, to everyone, Linda, see the change be you want to see. That's right. It all starts with us. If you want to, whatever you want, you have to be it yourself first. Thank you, everyone, for for watching, for listening, hearing. And if you could all subscribe, share, like, make comments, nice ones, hopefully. Tell us what okay. you'd like to hear in the future and uh, to help us grow. And from our yes. hearts to yours, we love all of you. And always for joy, joy peace, inner peace. Hey. If you have inner peace, you have it all. Right, you got it all. Right. Or if you just be present, just stand in the present. Don't be yep. always worried about the future or thinking of the past. Be present, and you will watch everything fall away. Yep. So we love you guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye, guys.